Hello, everyone, and uh, we want to uh, reassure you that you are at the summer faculty lecture, the last one of the series. And uh, this is a set for the House of Blue Leaves, in case any of you don't know why we have a couch up here with Dr. Osborne. Um, the summer is drawing to a close, and so only uh, the only announcements I have to make are the old uh, Creamery Preview performance in here at noon on Friday, and uh, several musical performances will be coming up coming out of the IST Music Department. We do want to invite you on behalf of the Committee on Lectures to uh, pay attention in the fall and show up for some things we have lined up throughout the year. We'll be opening with a comedian August 26th in C.Y. Stevens Auditorium. Auditorium Jake uh, Johansson will have Ryder and Beatty later in the fall, the Institute on World Affairs, National Affairs, many other things going on and we hope you'll pay attention and look for those in your calendar. Right now, I'd like you to uh, help me welcome Wayne Osborne from our history department. We'll be talking about the power of nonviolence. Thank you, Pat. Unfortunately, I was going to comment on how I'm glad to be back in Ames, Iowa. Having flown in from one of the coasts, it's always a light to be back in the heartland of the uh, nation and see what the people really are thinking, what they look like, how they behave. But since she said I was already here, that kind of blows that introduction. So I thought I'd begin in another way by thanking the management for the roses. Now, the topic today is the power of nonviolence. And somehow the rose symbolizes exactly what we're talking about. Because within the rose you have all kinds of symbolism. Of course you have beauty, you have petals which are individual but yet linked to a common cause, and at the base of the rose you have thorns which can represent coercion, power, and victory. Now beyond that, I've given you two handouts, and you notice on the back of one of the handouts, there is, there are snapshots of two famous people whom I imagine you will all recognize. The purpose of putting those people's pictures in that position could be very easily woven into my comments, but that wasn't the intention. Indeed, the intent originally was they just happened to be at hand when I was copying, so they slipped on. But as usual in history, we always find a reason for whatever occurs and whatever we use. So I decided two things. One, I know there are a lot of people here who have to be here because they're taking speech classes. And in your instructions in giving speeches, they give you a variety of things, especially public speaking. If you're going to get an agent and make a lot of money, you have to, you know, always begin with a few jokes. So there are your jokes. Nixon jumping. That's all it says on the caption of the picture. Nixon jumping. Nixon was our president who had a great historical sense. He used to go to waste disposal plants that were opening in DeKalb, Illinois, and say, this is a historical event. This is the first time a president of the United States has opened a waste disposal plant. Well, apparently he is saying in this picture, this is the first time someone jumped in front of this clock when he was a vice president. The other one is, of course, Einstein. Sticking out a tongue that is incredibly long. Now that's worthy of note because whenever anyone says Einstein, they always say, oh my God, Einstein, he's a genius. Now you can remember that Einstein has a long tongue. That's worthy of memory as well. Because in history, much is worthy of memory. The second reason I put that on, besides these extemporaneous made up ideas, is to keep, make you keep that hand out. I figure you may not like what's on the other side, or you may not think it's important, but you might want to keep the uh, other stuff to put on the bulletin board. All I request you do, you put a few X's on there so once in a while you remember what's on the other side, which is really the focus of my remarks today. A historic perspective 
on nonviolent, the power of nonviolent action. Now, having organized that title or come up with that title, the question was then how to, what to do with it. Now, historians usually come up with titles before they decide what they're going to do, and you build on that premise. My idea is that this term is something that has become increasingly familiar to us all since World War II. Indeed, depending on the age of my audience, uh, I was going to ask about how many veterans we had in the audience, but I'm afraid that I don't see too many veterans. And by veterans, I didn't mean veterans of armed services. I meant veterans of non-violent actions, because in this community, we do have a great number. And even if you haven't lived long enough, we all share a historic memory of events that have occurred in the post-World War II era. Civil rights, the civil rights movement, perhaps one of the most profound examples of nonviolent action that has ever occurred anywhere in the world. The anti-Vietnam activities of the late 60s and the early 70s. The more current anti-apartheid actions across America, including this community. And even more familiar to you because of its recent vintage, although this will take some little explanation later on, were the events surrounding Visha in Ames, Iowa this year. The point is, is that since World War II, we have been much more aware of this as a technique, of this as a technique for trying to convince people to do things which they rather would not do, trying to coerce people to take a stance which we are supporting, but to do so without using the techniques of violence. The other handout I have given you without the pictures comes from the preeminent scholar who has been talking about this for the last four decades a man by the name of Gene Sharp. And Gene Sharp has labored, as I said, for many decades studying nonviolence and particularly the power of nonviolence. And he now has gained something of international reputation with his most recent book entitled Making Europe Unconquerable by using nonviolent civilian defense techniques. It was reviewed recently in the New York Times book review by none other than George Kennan. Sharp's study identifies through history many incidences in which nonviolent actions have been used. And that's the chart on the back of the pictures. He summarizes something like two dozens that, a dozen of those events which have occurred in 20th century alone. But he argues that once we take this as a field for historical study, we can push that back much farther. The historian traditionally has studied power only in terms of its violent application. Therefore, when you take your basic history classes, you do run into a number of wars. Indeed, most of you could probably list, just from memory, 
at least a half, half a dozen wars. You might not be able to date them, but you would at least be able to come up with a name. Now you can probably come up with a whole list of nonviolent actions because it's becoming more prevalent since World War II, but if you were asked to push this back into the earlier centuries, you would be uh, more at a loss. And this is partly and primarily the fault of a historian who has not really taken that as an area of study. So Sharp's contention is that we can find examples of nonviolent action in the past. And to demonstrate this, he has himself tried to come up with a number of incidents. And I'll mention a very ancient one in a second. Why is he studying this? Why is he concerned for nonviolence? Simply because he argues that in the modern age, the technique of nonviolence is probably the most suited form of all forms of defense that we could adapt to our environments. And his argument is, is that by studying past nonviolent actions, which were on the whole spontaneously, spontaneous and unplanned, we can actually structure and plan and train ourselves to become practitioners of nonviolence to the extent that it could even be used for national defense. It's a very strong claim, a very new claim, a very innovative claim, one that people tend, of course, to dismiss as they plan for new weapons of violence, as they try to get contracts from the Pentagon, and as they try to make their fortunes in that process as well. The technology of the 20th century, and indeed the technology of the last hundred years, is one of the reasons why the concept of nonviolence and Sharp's position is getting a wider and wider audience. Simply stated, the battlefield has become uninhabitable for humans ever since really the invention of the machine gun. World War I should have demonstrated that to us. And certainly with the development of the atomic power, we all are aware of that in ways that we were not before. We are aware of the power to blow us all to smithereens from the existing arsenals of those weapons. At this point, I want to hit home on that a little harder, make the point about the existence of technology, which makes using, using warfare as a means of resolving conflicts really antiquated and something that eventually will have to go by the way of the dinosaurs. By asking the question, how much explosive power do we have in our nuclear arsenals. This is something of a parlor game ever since we found out there were so many nuclear devices in the world, which really kind of hit our consciousness total, in a total sense, in a public sense, around 1980. And you find writers trying to explain this. If you put all the bombs in uh, uh, semi-trucks on the equator, they would reach around the world so many times. The more recent one that I've heard is that if you went in, and there are about 50,000 nuclear devices, you know, something you carry on your back with a big, huge megaton each missiles. If you divided all of those nuclear explosive devices into Hiroshima-sized packets, and then decided to explode one of those every hour, 24 hours a day, it would take you 200 years to get rid of them. Words such as that or descriptions such as that help to tell us what we're talking about when we're talking about modern weapons technology. But I want to 
give you a more sensual experience of the comparison. And this is a sound comparison. So you have to sort of relax, to drift off into semi somnolence not as far as the men in Bloom County thinking of their ideal women, please, but somewhat into that state. And for this, I need a, a, a little prop, and some props. And I have it. This is very nice stage setting. It's full of props, but I had to bring my own. Now, some of you have heard, no doubt, about the ash bin of history. Probably Karl Marx said that, right? When, all, when most people get their PhDs, they get one of those hoods and a diploma. When historians graduate, graduate, they always get their own ash bin. So we can carry it around throughout our careers and discard outmoded ideas into the ash bin of history. The ash bin, though, is going to serve for another purpose, although symbolically it represents what I'm talking about. We'll place the ash bin here. Or here. And your first sound will be all of the explosive power of World War I. That is, every shell, every bomb, including the two atomic devices that the United States dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So this is the first stop. That's not the first sound, that's the lid, the handle going down. This is World War II. Compared to the 50,000 nuclear devices that we currently hold. That's why we're talking about possibility of developing other techniques. One BB to 5,999 is the ratio of the explosive power of World War II to the present nuclear arsenals. That was developed by a physicist somewhere, and uh, then it's used at various places around the country to demonstrate in a different way what we have developed in terms of our nuclear power. All right, well, we're going to talk a little bit about historical perspectives. So I want to give you some examples of nonviolent action so when you go away you feel at least you had a historian talking to you rather than an economist or a political scientist or a sociologist or someone else. So a little bit of history. I want to give you, uh, I guess I'll give you three quick examples of nonviolent action. And the first one I'm picking comes from Rome to demonstrate what I said about Sharp's contention that if we studied history enough, we could take this way back. The example from Rome involved an action in the 5th century BC, and it involves the citizens of Rome who felt they were being mistreated by their government. So what did they do? Well, they marched out of the city and went into what was equivalent, uh, perhaps, of a general strike. And they refused to return to the city until the government promised certain changes. And the government eventually did. Now the details of this are not very well fleshed in, 
But the point was, the citizens decided to force a change by grouping together and removing their support from the government. A few centuries later, you have an interesting twist again occurring in Rome. This time, one of the Roman armies had returned and found that the Senate dragging his feet on a reform package which the military favored. The army, and this is an army, mind you, instead of taking over the Senate and shooting the senators, did exactly what the citizens had done a couple of centuries early. They withdrew from the city and went to what by that time had become known as a sacred mount and threatened to set up a separate city, a Pavian city. And once again, the government in this case caved in. Now, of course, in this instance, you could say, well, it was because of the military and the implied threat of the military is there, and that indeed might be so. Now beyond that, there are not yet many good examples of nonviolent resistance prior to the late 19th and 20th century, that we know most at least about those periods. So I will move ahead now to the 20th century. And again, let me emphasize that the handout from Sharp's newest book, which you have with the pictures on the back, lists almost two dozen of those events. I want to mention Gandhi's role in nonviolent action, because in a sense, Gandhi does as much as anyone, at least because I suppose of his British Empire connection and our attachment to observing that, to bring nonviolent to the world attention, to the attention of the world. And Gandhi indeed is the person, if you go to the library and you scholar and you punch into the library, find titled Nonviolence, you'll come up with 39 books that have some relationship to nonviolence in the title and probably 50 to 60 percent of them mention Gandhi in the title as well. So his, his impact is immense, both from a theoretical point of view and also from the actual point of view of putting these concepts into action. He is looked to in particular because given his long experience both in South Africa and India, he had time to move from the spontaneous quality to planned action to planning in advance what was going to occur and how it should be conducted. Moreover, Gandhi used these approaches to promote both internal changes within Indian society and also to push for independence of India from Great Britain. The example I have chosen is from the former internal change. The issue involved the treatment of untouchables by high caste Indians. In the mid-1920s, in consultation with Gandhi, some of his followers decided that it was time to demonstrate and to try to change attitudes toward the untouchables. The technique they chose was simply a mass demonstration. And the issue was as follows. In a particular town, there was a Hindu temple. And in front of the Hindu temple ran a road, a main road, a main thoroughfare. Untouchables could not use the road because it would defile the temple by they would defile the temple by passing in front of it. And this became the object then of the demonstration. 
And so in mid-1920s, they simply marched down the road and stopped in front of the temple. And there they remained for the next nine months. At first they were beaten, then they returned. They placed barricades, the officials placed barricades up to keep them away from the temple. Still they stood, there was some rotational quality, they didn't re all remain all the time. When the rains come, as they always do in India, and the street flooded, they stood in the water up to their necks. And after this many months long period, the Brahman community in control of the temple finally acceded to their demands, over their demands. Symbolically or specifically to use the road, but of course, more importantly, to have recognition for their humanity and for their position within Indian society. The third example, I print because of its personal connection to many of us here at the university, and that is the famous example of the Norwegian teachers' resistance to the establishment of fascism in Norway. Maybe also because I know a lot of you guys are Norwegians, or a few of you at least. Or maybe because I know most of you are probably Germans, this is really closer to the mark, because all Iowans, majority of us, have German links. Just one of those facts. One of those facts, by the way, did you know most of your ancestors came from here to avoid the draft? Probably, because this was a period of time in which Prussia was on the move and they were conscripting armies to unify Germany. And many of your ancestors said, hey, we're just farmers. And we don't want to do that stuff. So they came to Iowa instead. I don't know whether they came before or after the Civil War because we got involved in that too. So maybe they ran into the same thing here. In any event, as you all know, World War II involved Germany and Hitler. And one of the things Hitler did, he really took over Western Europe very quickly. And by 1940, he had already, in the spring, marched into Norway. And after about a uh, two-month resistance, the armed forces of Norway collapsed, the king went into exile with his cabinet to London, and the Germans occupied Norway. As the uh, puppet leader, they put in a person by the name of Vidkun or Vidkun Quisling, hence the origin of the word Quisling. You call somebody a Quisling now, he is a traitor, he is a vendor. Then they patria, selling his own country out. Quisling was given orders by Hitler to establish a fascist regime in Norway. And one of the techniques that was going to be employed was to require that the teachers join a new organization, a new teacher's organization, one that was head by the head, uh, led by the uh, head of the Norwegian stormtroopers, and that they would then be required to indoctrinate the children into the precepts of fascism. At the same time, youth movements were going to be organized for the children. And the implication was that the teachers were expected to become like they often do, campfire leaders, Boy Scout leaders. They would be leaders of these youth organizations. So this was a scenario. It provoked a resistance effort. Underground leaders, and it's important to note that Norway had both an armed, violent underground resistance at the same time they were practicing nonviolence. So there's a, there's a sort of a dualistic type of process that is going on here. Underground leaders called upon teachers to simply reject this request 
and do more than simply reject, to write a letter to the Department of Education pointing out their resistance. There were some 12,000 teachers in the schools, public schools in Norway, and it's estimated that eight to 10,000 of those teachers wrote letters and signed their own names. In retaliation, the government threatened to dismiss the teachers and did close the schools for a month. The teachers counter-reacted by holding classes in private homes and by getting the parents mobilized to write letters to the government. It's estimated that something like 200,000 Norwegian parents sent letters of protest to the Norwegian government. The government then increased its pressure by arresting 1,000 male teachers and shipping them north to concentration camps. As the teachers traveled north on the train system and as they passed through smaller communities, school children, probably organized by their teachers, showed up at the railroad stations to sing songs and cheer, cheer them as an indication of their solidarity with the teachers. They were mistreated in the concentration camps, given meager rations, worked in arctic cold at, at uh, heavy tasks. But only a handful of the imprisoned teachers actually broke down and tried to make some agreement with the government. Meanwhile, in the schools, which had been reopened, the teachers on the home front also continued their resistance, despite rumors that the imprisoned teachers would be killed. Of course, this is ultimately an element in nonviolence, as one of those points in Sharp's list of the characteristics of nonviolence, which I handed out. Just because you're nonviolent doesn't mean that those against you will also be nonviolent. In other words, at a certain point in nonviolence, you have to accept the fact that you very likely could be killed. And that's one of the downsides of nonviolence. The teachers did not, in the schools, even though they were very concerned about the teachers in the concentration camps, continued to teach. And they not only continued to teach, but they read statements in their classrooms stating the importance of freedom of conscience for themselves and for those they taught. They said, quote, the teacher's vocation is not only to give children knowledge, Teachers must also teach their pupils to believe in and uphold truth and justice. Therefore, teachers cannot, without betraying their calling, teach anything violating their consciousness. consciousness. That I promise, the teacher speaking, that I promise you I shall not do. End quote. In the face of this tenacious resistance, Quisling floundered and under the directions from the Germans backed away from the confrontation. The teachers were released and the effort to use the schools to indoctrinate the youth ended. Teachers had been in prison for something like eight months. Now, of course, it could have turned out quite differently. The teachers in the concentration camps could have been shot. Many more could have been imprisoned. We know the capacity of the Germans when they make up their mind in this war to do a particular act. But even if the counterfactual history had occurred, what the Norwegian teachers had done would have been worthy of historical analysis in the same sense that any military battle, won or lost, is worthy of historical analysis. It is always amazing to me when I teach my classes is how victory in military confrontations are often claimed even when wars are lost. Well, it's similar for nonviolent. The loss of a war is not necessarily ever total. 
Power is certainly a central concept of our, of our era. It permeates our vocabulary and our actions. We speak of power lunches, which I assume is not what we get here in the Nathan show. We talk about power dressing. I assume that means clothes and not salad dressing. We talk about the power of money and also power as the best aphrodisiac. A famous quote of our marvelous Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, the great lover of who knows what. <laughs> Many of us historians fear power, especially when we as individuals are called upon to exercise it. And therefore, asking us or asking you to participate in nonviolent action is somewhat problematical. And indeed, in some senses, that's why we have the military. Because we have opted not to participate in our own defense. We have accepted the fact that when someone says defense, they define it to me, military defense. Look the word up in the dictionary. It doesn't say anything about using military means for defense. That is just one option, just as nonviolence is an option. Leo Tolstoy touched on another aspect of this power problem of becoming involved in nonviolent action when near the end of his life he observed, quote, that all the evil in the world comes from organization. Every kind of organization. Freeing us from any kind of human moral duties. Well, granted, Tolstoy is an anarchist, but his point is well taken. All too often, we give up our responsibility to an organization. And we think in terms of, well, how can I affect that organization? Or what is my position of power in that organization? Or I can't do anything because I'm powerless. And the marvelous thing about nonviolent action is that it contradicts all of those excuses. Because as we have seen time and time again in history, it is precisely those people without power, in many instances, without an organization, that have conducted very successful nonviolent movements. Civil rights movement is very much in our minds these days, not only because of Jesse Jackson's candidacy, but because of the presentation of the history of the civil rights movement on television. Many of you saw recently the eyes on the prize. And as you watch that, particularly the beatings of the people participating, you felt a twinge, or I felt a twinge. I, I cringed, wondering whether ever I would have sufficient courage to do something that brought down on my head blows that could kill. And I sense that that may be why we accept going into a battlefield, feeling shielded, falsely shielded, by some piece of modern technology that's going to prevent our death, but putting our lives on the line to be beaten and killed just seems too dangerous and too likely that that's going to happen. Now, having those thoughts, and of course that's part of the reason why, in a way, maybe we would space nonviolence out, is because if we really begin to think about it, the requirements of nonviolent action, especially as Sharp is arguing that it is possible to use this in defense of national territories, we realize that it's going to require much more participation on our parts that we may not be able to avoid the draft because we're women or because we're over 25 or because we have 10 kids or whatever reason because the idea of nonviolence is that it is something that can incorporate whole communities 
and it's not arbitrarily designed to limit and exclude people. Now, in an intriguing sense, the recent V shenanigans, I think, demonstrate some elements of nonviolence that we should be aware of or think about. As you all know, all know, a mass of uncoordinated students, many of whom had consumed more spirits than their young bodies could metabolize, virtually brought local government to a standstill in Ames, Iowa. Popular coaches had to be routed either out of their slumbers or from speaking engagements. Top-ranking administrators risked personal injury when missiles were lost their way. But the remarkable thing about the demonstrations, beside many other remarkable things, is that nobody got killed. And it was all said and done, luckily. But more than that, if those same students had gotten focused, had decided that there was some cause for which they were concerned, had it come out in several thousand anywhere in Ames, Iowa, they might have had an incredible impact. Just think what might have been the case if those students had been massed against U.S. policy in Africa or Central America or even the immediate self-interest element of higher tuition costs. The impact on the academic community this community, the state and the nation, would have been really quite profound. So, I think there is something in the community that can be built upon that is linked to some of that Visha experience. Indeed, this summer, there is already a coalition organized called the Tuition Freeze Coalition. You've seen them, they were in the paper last week. Some of the people are here in the audience. They're getting organized. I don't know what they're going to do, but I wouldn't be surprised that they don't try some types of demonstration, along with letter writing and persuasion and so on. So they're already at work and they'd be happy to give you information and sign you up in the process. Beyond that, there are many ways that you can become more active and thus empower yourselves. There are literally dozens of groups in mid-Iowa that traditionally act, not always in demonstrations, but certainly in a sense of a non-violent approach, in an attempt to affect, affect change and bring about improvements. For example, Amnesty International exists in this community. It is a human rights organization that writes letters, of course, for political prisoners around the world. It's been in existence now almost 30 years as an international organization. There are campus groups, such as the Action Group in uh, Anti-Apartheid in South Africa, and indeed, mentioning the Visha example as a potential action we shouldn't exclude the fact that students interested in that did succeed in getting the alumni fund to divest its investments in South Africa at the end of May when they had their meeting. If, if most students were in a way, they weren't so aware of that. But that, as an action, was more of a persuasive type of nonviolent action, trying to persuade a group with power to act. But it might have come, and in some senses, it had elements of more visible demonstrations that went back to the total disinvestment process. So that is another. And then there are uh, groups scattered throughout the community, some of those, plus the Iowa Peace Institute in Grinnell, Iowa. The Iowa Peace Institute in Grinnell, Iowa, where topics such as nonviolence, conflict resolution, the economies of peace and war, eventually will be more thoroughly studied. And here at Iowa State University, there are many 
place beyond the tuition freeze issue that you be can act and become involved in. One of those is to support the initiation of a peace studies program at Iowa State University. Currently, the Sciences and Humanities Breaking Committee has a recommendation that Iowa State consider establishing some type of peace studies program. Whether that will be a minor or be a major, we are not yet determined. But it's in the works. Last spring, the GSB passed a resolution in favor of offering this type of curriculum at Iowa State University. The premise being is that we all may find that the reality that we have assumed governs our lives is not that inflexible, that there are alternative approaches for everything, including self-defense. And in that process, I'm sure that the power of nonviolence will become more readily clear and perhaps even available to you for your individual application.